Excellent. Welcome to COVID-19, the orthopedic response, a production of the Digital Orthopedics Conference San Francisco team and UCSF Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I am your host, Stefan Obidi. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I'm also the chair and founder of the Digital Orthopedics Conference. And we're thrilled to be joined by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons as a global convener to address and rapidly respond to the dramatic changes to healthcare patients in our communities that we're seeing. Now, we're grateful to have a global audience joining us for this discussion, but I'm particularly pleased to welcome back Dr. I mean, well, I was Dr. I almost, almost doctorized you, Dennis Boyle, who is the senior leader of design uh, for health practice at IDEO, the, the famed design firm, an adjunct professor at the Stanford uh, D School, the design school, as well as Dr. Talia Butler, uh, pediatrician and medical director at, uh, at IDEO. And we want to acknowledge also Delphine and Delphine Wang, uh, who's a Kaiser Permanente and San Francisco General Hospital uh, ER doc, who also works with IDEO and contributed to this as well as all their team. So just to reframe it, what we did, which we think, we hope we might even be a first for a virtual conference. Well, yesterday, we crowdsourced several problems that people we're having imagined COVID. And then you guys took those ideas and did a design sprint. Now, Dennis, what's a design sprint? A design sprint in this case is trying to go as far down the path of designing something, especially from a conceptual standpoint, as one can in the time you have. So we had about 24 hours. So we're coming back Amazing. with the we had four designers and um, Talia and myself contributing. So there's six of us trying to move a, a, a rugby scrum down the field, if you will. So uh, we're, we're ready to show and tell what, what, what we came up with. Awesome. I'm going to share that screen down there. And I say we have the, one of the most talented design teams in the world contributing to us and coming back with our 24 hour design sprint solutions that we can uh, potentially conceive about. And I guess the big idea here is to show what design people can do in the context of healthcare and the value of bringing the, the design community into the fold to help solve the COVID-19 problem. So take it away, Dennis. And All right. Uh, so we're um, uh, just a, a bit of a, uh, about IDEO, we're an uh, innovation and design consulting uh, firm, 800 people worldwide in nine different locations. And uh, we, uh, we we look at this as a as a, a, a the, uh, an Apollo 13 moment for, for designers, innovators. There's that scene where uh, there's this big box of stuff by the, the, the engineers on the ground. We're trying to solve the problem that Apollo 13 astronauts had by one of their modules was not functioning. They had to make the landing module do for life support for three or four days. And so th there's some rough parallels here, but this is an Apollo 13 moment for the world. How can we make things work right now on the ground? So we, we, um, uh, we, we had this open uh, ask yesterday. Have, we had an ID design team standing by for a design sprint, 24 hours, try to, uh, we crowdsourced the, from the 4,000 plus people from the uh, audience. What, what were some of their biggest challenges that a design team might tackle? And uh, uh, here we are 24 hours later to show and tell what we um, have come up with as a team. And I'll flip over to Talia. Great, thank you, Dennis. So often when we do this, first of all, 24 hours is very unusual time frame. It'll take weeks or months, but we wanted to give this a try and we know how serious this pandemic is. Um, but we wanted to show you a little bit of our process before we can deliverable. So at the beginning, we pick a question. You all helped us do that yesterday. We do brainstorming and we'll tell you a little bit about how we do that in our special IDEO way. Then we vote, we pick the topics we want to build out a little bit more with prototyping and testing. And then ultimately we would do some experimenting and iterative design is what we do. Lots of processes. And that image is a example of how we might do this over and over and over again. So the other thing that's important to think about for human centered design or design thinking, for those of you who are new to this idea, is that we always start with the people. We want to know what is desirable. And that's why we started yesterday by asking you, what are the problems you want to solve? 
from there, we'll often build into the viability and the feasibility, and that's where we find innovation. But we always start with the people. That's the big part of human-centered design. So yesterday, you helped us pick a question. We used the chat bot. We used the ask a question feature. People voted. Um, this is a screenshot of that for those of you who weren't here. <clears throat> and this is where we started. Washing your hands and not touching your face are two very effective infection prevention measures. What solutions can IDEO come up with that can help remind people throughout the day to wash their hands and not touch their faces? So from there, we brought that uh, into a little bit of a different framing. We like to rephrase our questions using how might we statements or HMW. How might we helps us think optimistically with the how question generatively with the might question and collaborative with the we question. It doesn't point fingers. And we find that this framing can be very helpful, something you can take with you. So in this case, how might we remind people throughout the day to wash their hands and not touch their face? So from there, we brought our group of designers in. We had Ridma, who is a game designer, May, who's an interaction designer, Doan and Ross are both industrial designers. And this is a screenshot of us on our Zoom call yesterday, right after our session, getting together and making our plans for a quick sprint. Well, if, Talia mentioned kind of guidelines or rules. These are some things that we put up on our walls and, and uh, there's, there's deferred judgment. So don't judge ideas when you're come, trying to come up with them. Uh, encourage wild ideas. Try to push the limits. You know, just standard ideas aren't always going to work in situations of, like this. Build on the ideas of others. So you're working as a team, one conversation at a time, so everybody can hear the ideas. Stay focused on the topic. Be visual. Make a, a little bit of a sketch on a sticky note. Uh, or a, a piece of paper and then help that'll help explain it and then go for as many ideas in the time that you have you can see here um well we are normally together and we're all on top of each other putting up notes on boards well we can't do that these days but there's some remarkable uh, pieces of uh, software out there that are just getting better every day because everybody's trying to do this at once this is a piece of software called Mural that uh, our design team is getting better at it uh, at every day. Um, you can see we did some warm up uh, brainstorming sessions, household objects, uh, or, or communication channels, just to kind of like give, start the, the um, creative uh, energy flowing. And you can we zoomed out. You can see uh, the 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 extent of the kind of the quantity of uh, the brainstorming uh, ideas. Each little post-it note, a virtual post-it note, is is a concept of some sort. And in the cases below, you can see that people were writing on actual post-it notes, holding up to their camera on their their um, their laptops, and their, uh, the moderator is taking pictures of them. And so there's a kind of a combination of virtual and actual post-it notes images on on the uh, the boards so the, what sometimes this happens that uh the the original question gets is evolved by the design team to be even more uh uh more topical or, or uh, more um uh, important so that what we we came up with together as a team is how might we reinforce hygiene habits and social distancing for public safety. So combining these two things together uh, because they're so uh, at the top of everyone's list for advice around how to behave in, in this day and moment. Um, yeah. And just to show you a, a little bit more of our process, uh, here we have our team I'm holding up a post-it, which is why you can't see my face, uh, but we've got lots of visual post-its, people doing sketches either in Sharpie and by hand or on their computers. And those little green dots is how we help narrow what we want to build next. We come up with a lot of ideas and we know some of those ideas are going to be terrible, but sometimes those terrible ideas are what make us think of something good. And then we choose what we want to build up next. 
Another technique we have <clears throat> is uh, looking outside for inspiration and looking to analogous fields. So changing behavior, washing your hands more, it's kind of like brushing your teeth. So what are things we use to help determine how long we should brush our teeth for? There are different cues like music. We also can be inspired by little bells we put on our pets or cowbells so we know when they're moving. Might help us remember where our hands are and why we're moving them. And then from there, we jump right into concepts. So everybody at home can do this. Take a piece of paper and a pencil, and we talk about drawing stick figures all the time. This is a little bit hard to see, but this is a sketch of an idea of a soap that would allow you to see when your hands are clean and when they're dirty. Um, and you could add something to the soap so that it's a certain color and it would encourage hand washing. Um, and then I'll jump through another few concepts. This one is one we didn't build out any further, but it's a tattoo that when it's wet, it would be clear. But if you haven't washed your hands in an hour, it would get darker and darker and it would be a visual reminder. So lots of different ways that people can help remember. Um, and the next two uh, are early stage shots of what has gotten built out a little bit more. So this is another hand washing concept. Um, and this is an app to help us think about social distancing. So last night, uh, this is where we got to. We had all these ideas. We talked about them a little bit more. And then uh, the team took a break, had some dinner. Um, and you can see uh, here that we even took more post-its and tried to build on ideas so that this morning when the team picked up again, they would have more ideas to create further progress. And uh, just another reminder of the, this process um, starts with with people and we start to layer on technical factors uh, and business factors as we go. But at first it's really got to work for people in one form or another. Um, again, this process, if you go to another diagram, it, it, go, it diverges uh, to during the inspire understand phase and then it converges to try to get to fewer concepts. And then you, you uh, diverge again with fewer concepts with a little bit of visualizing and prototyping. And uh, uh, after this point, you would begin to refine and develop um, typically. The, this phase typically lasts weeks or in some cases months, uh, uh, so, but we're, we're trying to push it for, for a matter of hours here. The, the, this was a, um, a little session we had this morning with the, the a, a group of 16 or 18 people uh, here. I'm showing drinking my coffee here. Um, uh, but but uh, we, we put up these concepts on, in front of them and got feedback. All the little sticky notes uh, that you see on the concepts were what their impressions were as, as well. We're all kind of users in this current um, uh, atmosphere of uh, how to modify and pr promote um, healthy behaviors during this uh, pandemic. So we took that and fed that back to the design team. Um, the design team was listening in some cases and, and uh, a couple of very interesting kind of um, uh, questions came out as they always do. What if you can incentivize people to go to non-chronic places like Pokemon Go? What if directed towards areas that are safest with the fewest people and the widest streets? When is it good to go outside? Uh, is it conversation that happens every day? How might we um, leverage some of these and build these things into uh, um, the, the concepts that are being developed? So one uh, concept that came uh, up and was developed to uh, a, a little higher fidelity was um, uh, what we call the bubble app. Um, that's a mobile application that helps you social distance. Uh, it's a couple of concepts here, but everybody travels with a smartphone these days. This is an application that uh, helps understand how to keep people uh, at least six feet apart and give you uh, feedback and interaction if you are or not in this. Um, the, one, the, the next screen is uh, what the app might look like, avoid um, these certain streets which have high foot traffic when you're planning uh, an outing, trying to go outside. It might remind you in the case to wear, wear a, a mask or, um, or 
wear gloves or wash before and wash after. Um, the people, um, we think of this as people are about to burst your bubble when you are too close. Um, and it, it's recording all along as you go along because there's quite a bit of technology built into smartphones as, as they exist. And we believe this could be um, implemented uh, for, with some sort of with some Bluetooth and other types of uh, technology that's possible. And then when you get home, uh, the screenshot uh, tells you um, you've, how far you've walked, how many people came inside the six foot bubble. Um, and, and it could contribute data to your, um, your city's so safe distancing kind of initiative or um, helping kind of anonymize data to get out there to see how a population is doing. And, uh, and then there's possibly a, 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 sport, small, a strong forcing function that occurs that, that this will not, you can't turn this off on your phone until you've clicked done. You've, you've finished the hand washing for 20 seconds. You've wiped down your phone surfaces and door. You've clicked off a little checklist of things that you should do once you have returned to your home from an outing. So after 24 hours, a, a client or a, 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 a team will ask what are next steps to make the plan here. Uh, some, a few, a quick little list of understanding if and how it is valuable to, through the, the, this concept is valuable, making a quick little prototype, a little click through prototype on the phone itself. We would extreme, interview extreme users, people who were very paranoid about, um, um, breaking the rules and those that uh, on the other extreme, those that weren't, they were kind of laissez faire. So to try to understand if this, where this would, uh, how to make this appeal to more people in, in the population is data privacy a concern. Is there a way we can make this feel comfortable for users? Um, who might we partner with this to create more value and accelerate bringing some, this application to market considering a local government or maybe a state government or map uh, software people or public health uh, departments, who's, who's sponsoring this and who's uh, keeping this going. Um, and we practice, begin to practice iterative design where we take all this feedback and update the design, start making pilots and go out for higher numbers uh, and, and test with higher numbers as we try to quickly move this into a, a position where it could be released on, on app stores or, or uh, so that's that's that. Maybe Talia, flip to the next one. Yes. Yeah, so um, after you've gone out, your app reminded you to wash your hands. We went to, for a little bit of a different style here, and now we're thinking about how do I make sure I am washing my hands well. So we used HMW, or how might we? How might we provide clarity of how well your hands are washed? Um, so this is a product that could be attached to an existing sink or faucet, um, kind of like those old uh, wrist bracelets that we had in the 90s or um, the modern uh, Apple Watch uh, could be made of silicone or rubber. Um, and it uses UV light to highlight any remaining dirt or particles on your hands. So just to see it in action a little bit, uh, it might use a sensor or proximity sensor to turn on your faucet. Once you start washing your hands, the music plays and there's an auditory cue to say 20 seconds, maybe you sing happy birthday. Um, but there's also lots of other memes going around for how to remember 20 seconds. And then uh, after you're done, um, it shines the light and the light would allow you to see are there any spots that you missed and it would also reinforce any uh, good habit. So if you can't see any dirt, you did a great job. This helps keep people mindful about the process of washing your hands, engaged. It helps make the invisible visible. Um, and it, it does it in a way that's kind of fun and joyful um, and not, not so serious all the time. So next steps for something like this would be to interview users again to help understand hand washing behaviors. Um, then, you know, the quick and dirty version would be to hack existing products and try to make a workable prototype. Um, we'd experiment with different features and then we'd look into partnerships. So 
Do any uh, light companies want to add a feature like this or fixture companies that would we could partner with to help us refine and uh, produce the design? I remember um, uh, just on this last one, uh, uh, an idea that was kind of a uh, team came up with is that maybe this uh, kind of software, the timing software could exist on a smartwatch or something like that, uh, that would uh, give you some of this function by helping with a, a song or a, t a countdown timer because it senses you washing your hands. So it's a, kind of an addendum. Right. Because your phone is pro in proximity almost yeah. every time. So yeah. just you're activated, you have to worry about funny. Yeah. It's a brilliant guy. Um, I'm, I can't wait for the bonus uh, feature. <laughs> That was so much fun. Um, so uh, a couple of ideas just came up right near the end that you sometimes can't help yourself with. And we 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 have a, a practice we call the parking lot just to put them over here because we're working on a couple of main things. But but the whole idea of using uh, your watch or uh, uh, some Fitbits or some of the things you're already wearing that give you um, visual or um, audible or um, vibrational feedback. Um, the thought was that if, when you raise your hand above your your neck, um, the likelihood is that you're about to um, touch your face. I mean, there's other things that you could be doing, but um, th th it'll give you a bit of feedback here, whether it's um, auditory, you can adjust it to make it just vibrate so you're not hearing a, a blaring siren every moment, but, but it will help you um, uh, change your habits and be more aware of when your hands are approaching your face. So that, uh, that, that, uh, appealed to everybody on the team and wanted to uh, put that out, out forward. Uh, and this is another idea that people on the team were excited about because we know PPE is in such high demand and the bottom line is we don't have enough of it. Um, and what do we do with what we have until we have enough of it? So this was inspired actually by a special type of goggles that downhill um, racers might use when their face gets full of mud, they can take off a screen, bike kind of a racers. plastic bike yeah. racers. More Thank bike you, Dennis. Racers. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is kind of an N95 with lots of layers of a surgical mask on top of it. So you could keep your own N95 clean, but if you were seeing a patient that uh, was on droplet precautions, you could just rip off one layer of the mask. So this is, again, how might we quickly iterate to apply our learnings and improve existing products rather than creating something entirely new. All right. right. Well, yeah, this, this, this is our uh, one thing that there's many sayings and quotes that drive us, but this is certainly at the very top where uh, to predict the future, you, you invent it. So we try to live this uh, every day. And again, this has been a, a inspiring process and we hope you feel the same way and uh, thank uh, uh, Stefano and his team for the opportunity here to, uh, present this i i thought that was brilliant i don't think it's been done before to have a design sprint inside a virtual conference triggered by requests from the community with an output that is so creative and so just wow i loved it i even i, I love this man just real quick if these ideas are now out in the community if somebody wants to take of these and iterate on them it's okay yeah, they're open source. <laughs> open source now. That there was are, absolutely at least brilliant. 4,491 people have just seen them. So <laughs> <laughs> we're excited about that. Uh, I have one question in the queue, but I want to just ask you a couple of questions so that people understand the process a little bit better. Um, those who have come to DocSF previously, uh, you, you've, you've by definition worked with IDEO. Um, Dennis, actually, I should probably worth mentioning within a week or a few days that I came up with this concept of maybe doing digital face conference. I happened to hear Dennis speak at a conference at Stanford. I was so impressed. I went up and said, listen, I got this crazy idea. What do you think? And he offered to support this thought process and encouraged me to move forward and has been generous with his time and effort and his team to come to every single DocSF we've ever had and also provide uh, sessions 
for our team to go through a design thinking process. And what you're seeing today is the power of the design thinking community to support us clinicians in our, in our, in our ability to, to address uh, challenges that we're having, whether it's COVID-19 driven or otherwise. And in the session with Michael Blum, you can also hear how design thinking uh, is enabled the the University of California, San Francisco to change completely their internal culture and how they handle uh, uh, challenges that need quick responses. So the reason I saw that is because we, we focused, uh, or at least my attention is focused on the result. I'd like to go back a little bit, how you build a team to do a sprint like this. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Talia, normally you have more than just designers in a team. Want to talk a little bit about that, you or Dennis? about who needs to be in the room, what's well, that look like? I, I'll, I'll let Natalia add too, but what we try to do is put together uh, teams that have a number of different disciplines on them. In this case, having uh, some visual designers, uh, an interaction designer, uh, which, was, which was May, uh, the, the visual <laughs> designers were Doan and and uh, Ross, and then Redima was a, is a, play lab designer, toy designer to, for, to bring some of that kind of lively uh, energy around um, uh, making things usable and playful. Uh, how, how would you add to that, uh, Talia? Yeah, I think we always make our teams of people from different disciplines and different backgrounds. And in addition to that, this is really a co-design process. So we always design with the people we're designing for. So you can, other terms of that are participatory design or the co-design process. And we love to design either with our clients and or with our users. So in this case, we talked about the people we might interview, but in addition, you know, perhaps surgeons who are scrubbing their hands very often, they would be interesting users to think, understand hand washing procedures. Yeah. Um, yeah. And similarly, people who live on the streets who don't have an opportunity to wash their hands very much, um, what could we learn from them? So we always try to learn from everyone and we bring people along for the process so that you can see the divergence and the convergence and help us decide what the best ideas are so that our designers can bring them to the next level. Um, thank you for the, the explanation. And then you you um, iterate by having this really large set of ideas that are open, or people are very, uh, very no blame environment, that no idea is too, too silly, too stupid, right? And then the team, how did then, how did then go from all those ideas, including the crazy ones, down to uh, the ones that maybe have more likes to them. How does that, what's that look like? Talia, you wanna take that one? Sure, so you know, we love to come up with the crazy ideas, like you said, and then uh, when we're in the office, we take little stickers like we're children, um, <laughs> and we put them on the post-its that we like the most, and then those ideas that have the most stickers on it, that's where we start building out a little bit more, and again, we kind of do this diverging and converging process. So we'll take an idea, one idea, and we might build three examples of it. And of those three examples, we like one the best. So then we'll, you know, iterate on that a little bit more. Um, it, you know, it's somewhat of a democratic process, but when we're working with the client, we also have to understand what are the constraints. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if if we want to design something with that involves UV light, how much does a UV light bulb cost? Right. Um, and so yeah. it, yeah, I, I'd just add to that that the clients some oftentimes in the room and they're helping vote to have this uh, convergence process or we take ideas out from quick little sketches or quick little models that demonstrate the process and show them to this uh, range of users that Talia mentioned where people are uh, very engaged, they're professionals or they're very uh, disengaged and they're, they're quite far away from the, the, the problem. Oh, I, I think you might be. Uh, I'm sorry, I cut myself out. I'll do it again. I apologize. I'm sorry. Try to get my. Uh, anyway, in a question from Alonzo Sexton: In the healthcare world, are there any general barriers that you have found as major limits to progressing from design stage to implementation? So, very much a healthcare question in here. Well, 
I mean, we look at constraints as kind of good to have guidelines, but of course, any healthcare product or service or um, system is is quite highly regulated. So we have to work with the FDA and all sorts of other kind of regulatory bodies. T today's, at th this moment, some of these things are being shortcutted because there's such a great need. Um, Talia, you, what, what else might you add there? Yeah, I think the regulatory side of things can sometimes be a barrier to faster implementation, but safety is, is real and it's really important when you're doing something and you could affect a person's life in a serious way. Um, and so we definitely have to account for that regulatory and safety factors. Um, and the other thing we do, we think about is we know there's a lot of stakeholders in the healthcare system, right? So there's patients, there's doctors, there's nurses, there's other healthcare providers, there's hospitals, there's insurers, there's, uh, you know, the companies that are providing all of the healthcare goods. And so thinking about what is the perspective of all of those different stakeholders when you're trying to bring a process or implement something new can be very relevant. And that's part of why someone like me, a doctor is on the team at IDEO to help understand some of that uh, at a deeper level and earlier on. And I'd just add to that too, there's no substitute for testing and testing and more testing. Even in accelerated projects, you ha more than any other category we work in, you, you there's much less room for error if, if people's uh, health is at stake. And so you've got to build these virtual tools, software tools, um, processes, uh, um, you know, uh, experiences in, in clinics or in, in other places or, or products. You've got to build prototypes and test them with enough people that you can give uh, yourself um, uh, uh, and, and pass all the um, hurdles that need to be passed so that you're not releasing something out there that is dangerous. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to rephrase one of these questions a little bit from Jeffrey Blander. I think what he's trying to get at is how do you, how do we get, a, there are some great ideas of being published on the internet. There are people at home using 3D printers coming up with curl ideas. How does, how do ideas like that, get out into community and get used and get into the hands you could use them. What's the, how do you, what kind of pathway do you see evolving or should uh, designers, thinkers, inventors have as they create concepts that they think would be helpful to the healthcare community? What's that path look like? Hmm. Well, eh, there's a lot being produced. I mean, you have to get it out in, in, in some way in front of people if you're kind of an independent inventor. Um, uh, there's a lot of yesterday's talk. We, we went over how many things are coming online uh, in, in the PPE space, for instance, or in the ventilator space, for instance, uh, people are putting their going open source with their ideas. Um, you need, you need people, you need to get from the open source to a, somebody that can produce the products or services. And so I think we're in that big phase right now. Uh, all the big corporations are starting to line up to try to do their part. Uh, the auto companies and the medical products companies. Uh, there's a, I think we're going to see remarkable innovation and things happen that we've never seen before. But that's that. There's a lot. Uh, there's some unknowns. Uh, yeah. Just to, to build on that a little bit, I think, you know, open source is big right now and that helps speed up innovation. Um, but really, like Dennis said, getting the ideas into the right person's hands, right? So we at IDEO, like Dennis talked about yesterday, have been doing a face mask project, um, uh, face shield, excuse me. And uh, we made one prototype or a few prototypes. We gave it to some doctors. They tried it out. They gave us feedback and then we bring it back. And uh, that's how you get your ideas going. Give it to, as, assume, assuming it's safe, you give it to one person to try. And uh, if they like it, hopefully it has its own legs. But I think that's another interesting point that we need innovation, not just in the products and the services, but in the supply chain. Um, so we need people thinking about that as well.
Yeah, I mentioned the Emergency Design Collective yesterday's um, session. That if you go back and look at that, but that's a UCSF-based uh, innovation uh, co collaboration with designers all over the world, over 100 or 200 people part of this. Uh, they 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 pr already pr um, published three or four different things in the space of of PPE and and blood donation and others. Uh, take a look at that emergency design uh, collective uh, started by Dr. Amanda Salmon, a UCSF uh, trauma surgeon. Um, so, uh, but but yeah, they they've anticipated that that what we're seeing now. My phone's lighting up right and left. Where the CDC is starting to. Um, Put, uh, promote uh, all people uh, wearing masks, but there's the big challenge of if if that's the case, um, are, are are all people taking masks away from healthcare providers? So they're pr promoting making masks yourself or doing um, do it yourself kind of uh, home masks. Uh, so you're going to see all this come to light in the next day or two here. Yeah, there's a couple of notes from Lou Sean, who's watching and participating in their questions. He himself uh, works with several universities, BME design programs, himself as an inventor, and was uh, asking a little bit about, um, could there be a COVID design challenge, a, a group out there, maybe even sponsored by the IDEO, where it uh, brings together some of the design firms to solve some of these COVID problems, kind of like we did today. Uh, sounds like an interesting idea. I don't know if that's feasible. I, I just repeat that the, the Emergency Design Collective is already doing that, and we're right. participating in two or three or, or four of those projects. And they've got other uh, firms like Frog and uh, other firms kind of part of it. And there's individuals. So I'd, find, I'd look at that as one suggestion at first. Terrific idea. So, um, yeah, so Lou, I think we'll direct you there and hopefully you'll be able to get involved. It sounds like you yourself are integrated in some of those design schools and can help about that. And Mike Ryan has a question that I would have asked myself. He is obviously with us at DocSF. And uh, what's the best way for us to continue taking some of these design sprint ideas and moving ahead and revisiting them in DocSF 21? I mean, I do have a thought, actually, if I can share with you publicly. Perhaps we can. the boss. Yeah, well, I know, but it's like this. You know, we have already sort of mentioned that is that one of the themes for DocSF 2021, the Jork Peace Conference, is sort of come up with a, a roadmap for development for uh, what we'll need in orthopedics. That roadmap uh, a year ago would look very different. It'll look next year. Uh, but we could probably use some of these uh, concepts, ideas, processes that you just outlined. Uh, at DocSF to, to help ideate and streamline and think through some what, what we need to where we need to go for the next uh, say five years. I could I could completely agree and I think you're in a position a remarkable position of leadership, uh, Stefano. Uh, in, in that by by the time of Doc SF twenty one in January, we you could we need to be better prepared for this this pa pandemics we just are woefully unprepared so uh, when we, there's some time to think a little bit more out of the emergency uh, kinds of thinking that, that could be a, a a great part of your your next effort it seems to to us outstanding well i think we'll close the session we're we, we're going to call it a, a day thank you so much for participating it's been a first uh, first potentially worldwide who knows maybe but it's definitely an innovative idea that we had you guys were amazing your designers are amazing those drawings those concept drawings were so good um i learned so much thank you both for participating uh, big thanks also to delphine and the rest of the team back at ideo that spent so many hours uh, showing us what can be done, what the design community can contribute through to COVID-19 uh, response. Yeah, we Thank to, you. Yeah, we get to stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. And uh, again, it's been an honor to be part of your, you, you put this whole function together in the last week. It's just remarkable to see how well it's come off and how much it's added to the world. So thanks again for inviting us. And on that, I want to acknowledge there's a whole team behind me who volunteered their time as well. 
uh, and we'll, I, thank you. I'll let them know. <laughs> thank you. Including your spouse. <laughs> oh, yes. I grab everybody and, here. Sean has uh, long and hours, and Nancy and yeah. Mike and Christina and Guido, if one of my fellows who got stuck here from Italy he couldn't go home. He couldn't come to work. We had no surgery for him to do. So I said, hey, why don't you help us out? So uh, Giulio Santi has been amazing. Okay, great, folks. Thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.